Today is Monday, May 21st, 2018, and we are at the Moline Public Library in Moline, Illinois. My name is Jan LaRoche. I will be interviewing Daniel Johnson for the Illinois Veterans History Project on behalf of the Moline Public Library. Dan was born on August 24th, 1935, and is 82 years old. Also present is Linda Johnson. Okay, well first Dan, thank you for coming and being with us here today. Um, I was wondering if we would start off by you telling me a little bit about your life before the service, you know, where you grew up, what your family was like. I was in a single parent family in Kiwani. Uh, my father was killed in World War II in the Army Air Force. And uh, so I grew up in Kiwani and went to school there at Wethersfield, graduated Wethersfield High School eventually. Uh, in class of 1953. He, uh, I did uh, a lot of usual high school work and sports, uh, played football, basketball, track, etc., baseball, and uh, did a lot of farm work. And I was very interested in agriculture. I did want to go to the Coast Guard Academy and had an opportunity to test one time but just did not have the resources in order to do that, so or any other college for that matter. So I chose to go in the Air Force upon the conclusion of my junior year. Uh, I figured I could uh, finish my high school by GED in the Air Force. And uh, then I just, from there on, I was strictly Air Force. Um, after that, after I got in the Air Force. Of course, I didn't know what to do, and I, I wanted to fly because my father had been a gunner in the, in the Air Force, or Army Air Corps. And uh, when I went through basic training, they told me, they said, no, son, you're not going to be able to fly because you're colorblind. Well, lo and behold, they threw me into weather school, and not knowing that it, it was, you had to be color efficient in order to be in school in weather school because everything is color coded. I lasted two weeks there and then they put me to paint in orderly rooms. I walked out of school and put me and seven other guys to paint in orderly rooms. And that was when the time of the uh, uh, colors came out that uh, were beyond the basic colors and I, Lord, I don't know what the orderly rooms looked like at that time after we finished, uh, finished with them. Eventually, I wound up, they sent me on a, a tour down to Memphis Municipal Airport, Tennessee, and I became a personnel clerk down there. And I lasted in that for a couple months, was on the uh, honor, burial, honor guard for burials of uh, military funerals. And uh, I lasted about two or three months down there, and an opportunity came up to go to a new organization that was forming in the Air Force. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew how, where, what it was going to do or anything else. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's a chance I got to take. So they wanted some wanted people that were below a certain rank. And I fell into that category. And my boss said, go ahead and go. And I got cleared and went and wound up in Donaldson, South Carolina, Donaldson Air Force Base, Greenville, South Carolina. And lo and behold, we became load masters on flying status. And they told me I'd never be able to fly, and boy, did I guess I fooled them. Uh, it was, uh, but nobody ever asked me about being colorblind. And uh, so from there, we went to, uh, I went through some training there at Donaldson, wound up in Tule, Greenland a couple months later um, when my class was doing their, their uh, class visit or class trip out of high school. They were on the Mich Lake, Michigan, going up to Mackinac Island, and I was in Tule, Greenland, airdropping supplies on that was forming the dew line for the defense of the United States and forming the uh, radar stations up on the ice cap. After I returned from there, I uh, 
went into a, a unit that was called Combat Control, which was also in our squadron. Uh, and it was a small unit, it was something that was just being absorbed from the Army. And it was uh, essentially what is known today as Special Operations. Uh, we had to be qualified parachutists, so I got the chance to go to wonderful Fort Benning, Georgia. Myself, seven other airmen, 320 Army guys, and two Marines. And two Marines washed out on the first day of training. And I thought, well, we're doing pretty good because the Air Force guys lasted. In any event, we completed that, went back to Donaldson, and a new squadron was being formed. They needed some loadmasters, so I reverted back to my other specialty and became a part of the cadre of the new squadron being formed, which eventually wound up in Chateauroux, France. And we spent five, seven days on a ship going over to uh, Bremerhaven, Germany, and then took a train down to Chateauroux, which was a brand new base. It was all brand, everything was Quonset huts and mud. Uh, we, from there I lasted on perhaps another two or three months, and we opened up a detachment down in New Assur, French Morocco, down in Casablanca. And I went down there with six other guys, and we formed a detachment down there to do some uh, freight work and airdrop work uh, with the uh, uh, with the French, and we stayed there for about a year. They sent me back to Germany, and uh, I went to uh, I don't remember the name of the base now, but anyway, we went to a small base in Germany. And we did some airdrop work up there. And uh, just for the sake of uh, clarification, airdrop means parachuting equipment and supplies and personnel by parachute out of an aircraft over a combat zone. Um, we came out of Germany, went back to Chateauroux, and I eventually rotated back to the United States. I was malassigned to a, a uh, Boom, uh, an air refueling organization at Lockbourne Air Force Base, Columbus, Ohio. And they said, well, you, you're on, the, when I first reported in, they said, well, you're going to go to the motor pool. And I said, but I'm on flying status. And they said, oh. So after a visit with the IG, I managed to get over to uh, an air refueling squadron that was being trained as a boom operator and on KC-97s. And uh, the unit was selected to go to Goose Bay, Labrador for a 90-day rotation, and I was due to be re-enlisting, and I said, they asked me to go, and I said, no, I don't want to go to Goose Bay. I've been there before. And it was a horrible place to be, out in the middle of nowhere. So I didn't go to Goose Bay. I got out of the Air Force, went to work for Sears and Roebuck, lasted two weeks there. I went across the street to the post office and said, give me six more years, I re-enlisted. And from there, I'll stop and think now. <laughs> from there, I went to uh, back to uh, went to Burtonwood, England, and I was over there for two years. And during that two years, we were involved in the Lebanese crisis, where there was we airlifted a bunch of the 11th Airborne Division out of Germany and moved them into Beirut. And I was there, I don't exactly remember how much, about a month or so. And we came out of Beirut, back to Burtonwood, and the organization was being disbanded and sent to France. I wound up in Drew Air Base, France, and still doing the same job, only now I became an, uh, a platform instructor teaching other loadmasters the basic fundamentals of airdrop. Uh, after a couple of years and there, we eventually wound up down in the Belgian Congo for the Congolese crisis. Uh, and the Belgians were being run out. They, they had given the country back to the, the Congolese. And of course, they rioted and they disrupted everything and were killing the Belgians. And we got managed to get a bunch of the Belgians out of the Congo. 
And also during that period of time, I was managing, I was sent over to Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa, uh, to Haile Selassie's uh, kingdom, to orient to some officers and some of their enlisted people on airdrop and load preparation for airdrop. Uh, upon return back to Drew, I was rotated back to the States and wound up in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and I lasted there, I was put on the 141 test program when the one C-141 first came out of production. And was put on that test program, but Vietnam interrupted that, was sent to Vietnam, Thompson Hood Air Base, and outside of Saigon. And flew the 123s and 130s in uh, Vietnam. And eventually was sent back over to Clark Air Base where I was sent back in to fly 130s back into Vietnam. And eventually I rotated back to the States, back to Charleston, was picked up as an advisor to the Air Force Reserves to a unit was being formed at March Air Force Base, California. I went to March Air Force Base with myself and, and a full crew on C-124s. And we lasted there probably another year and a half or somewhere there about, and they wanted to send me to Vietnam again. I said, well, I don't think so, because there's a lot of people that my specialty had not been to Vietnam yet. And I had already been overseas a number of times, and these other folks hadn't. In any event, I took my discharge, came back to Illinois, wound up in working for Air America over in Southeast Asia again as a contractor and for several months and then I came back to the States and was reintroduced into the Air Force back at Scott Air Force Base and was flying as an instructor on one C-124s down there and the unit was disbanded about two years later. I was sent down to Charleston to go back on my C-141s as an instructor and I lasted there for another five, six years and eventually wound up down at uh, Scott Air Force Base working in the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center uh, looking for downed aircraft within the continental United States. And uh, that was an experience in itself. It was a non-flying job, but it was command and control and I lasted there about five, six years, and eventually my retirement came up, and I took the retirement out, transferred from active duty retirement into the active reserves, and I stayed there for another 13 years, which gave me a culmination of 42 years, eight months, and five days, but who's coming? Excellent. Um, do you have any uh, special stories that you remember, any particular friends? Anything that oh, happened on or off? They were all <laughs> friends. You never met a greater bunch of people. Uh, I get emotional about that because a lot of them didn't make it. Um, yeah, I still have one good friend who lives out in Phoenix, Arizona, that uh, we maintain continuity with. And he, and he was one of my students on Charleston. And, uh, but he's a good buddy, and uh, we were all stationed off and on together over a couple of years, several years, and that was about the extent of it. There were a number of others, but most of them are deceased now. What was your family life like during your time of service? Hectic. <laughs> it was, you know, it wasn't much, much family life. You know. I was gone quite a bit because of job demands, you know, but it, to me it was better than without the college education, which eventually I got some uh, through the Air, uh, Air Force, but without the, to come back to Illinois and work in a labor job such as a factory or what have you in production. It was just not my forte, and that's the reason I chose to stay in the Air Force. How do you think being in the service affected your, you, your, your grow, outlook on life? Made me grow up. Made you grow up. It uh, gave me a better vision. It taught me that 
If you think you got a bad day, look at the other guy. He may have a bad day or worse. And may have come from worse background than you did. So you can't sit around and feel sorry for yourself. Uh, a lot of these individuals that I served with came from very, very poor backgrounds. And I thought I was bad, but they were a lot worse than I was. And I had an appreciation then for what I grew up with, even though we were on the wrong side of the tracks and we were poor. Do you have any words for people today if they're serving or I civilians? I wish the draft was back. Okay. Because I think both male and female deserve to grow up our culture has gone to hell in the handbasket. And I really feel that the military, even with the losses that we suffered in Vietnam and in Korea, those that served, even the draftees, they grew up and it became men and women and they were respected. We don't have that today. Anything else that you'd like to share? Not really. <laughs> okay. Well done. Or Dan, sorry. Uh, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to do this interview, and thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank you very much.